going in. Uh, but we'll we'll get going anyway. So welcome to those that are here to this Men in Mind Addressing Men's Mental Well, Mental Health and Wellbeing seminar today. Um, the seminar has been organized by Global Action on Men's Health and is supported by those organizations you see along the bottom. So that's Georgetown University's Centre for Men's Health Equity, the Canadian Men's Health Foundation, the International Journal of Men's Social and Community Health, and Promundo, which is now Equimundo. So just to flag that uh, the event has been supported by those organisations. If we could move on, Peter. So just some housekeeping before we get going. So if people could sign in using the chat, um, keep it just to name an organisation so that we're not flooding the chat with too much text, that would be great. As we go through the three presentations that we're going to have today, if people could use the Q&A to ask questions, make comments, share thoughts. We are hoping that this will be as interactive as possible within the context of a, a virtual uh, seminar. So please, please do um, put your questions and comments, et cetera, in the, in the chat. And just to note that the webinar is being recorded and will be posted on the Global Action uh, website. If you could move on, Peter. So just to outline the programme whilst people continue to arrive, I'll shortly set the scene and I'll do that in two ways. I'll do that in terms of um, where this has come from in relation to global action on men's health agenda and how it fits in with their current work and then do a, a very brief general introduction to the importance of um, men's mental well-being globally. We'll then move on to the first presentation by Derek Griffith, which is looking at black men's mental well-being. We'll then move on to the second one, men masculinities and trauma with Cody Ranganisi. And then we'll move to the third presentation, which is MindFit Toolkit and Digital Resources by TC Carlin. I'll introduce each of those three speakers more fully when we get to um, the point of each of their presentations. And then the final half hour, because we will try and stick to time with the presenters, each of which have got 15 minutes, and then we'll move into a discussion. Because we're tight for time, at the end of each of the three presentations, we'll only probably have a minute or two um, for questions. And we're gonna restrict that to what we're calling clarifying questions. So not questions that are intended to generate discussion and debate at that point. If you could please leave those until the discussion part at the end. That would be very helpful. So, they'll, like I said, there'll only be a very, very brief time at the end of the, each of the three presentations for questions that you might want to help clarify points. Uh, okay, I hope I've not missed anything out in that introduction. So, I'm going to talk very briefly now about the context within which this work has come about. So this webinar actually marks the start of a, a detailed look by Global Action on Men's Health at Men's Mental Health. And Global Action have recently appointed researchers to take a more detailed look at how mental health policy globally takes account of men. And the idea is that today's um, presentations, but more importantly, the discussion at the end of those presentations will actually contribute to this part of Global Action's work, which is why we're very keen that you uh, contribute with your questions and comments, particularly in that end section, but popping them in the uh, chat box along the way. 
And it's expected that the mental health policy report will be published from that work. And hopefully that will be available in the first quarter of 2023. And the intention is that that will then support advocacy work by Global Action on Men's Health on the important issue of men's mental health. So that leads us on to think about why, why is it important to consider men's mental health? And there's, there's obviously several elements and aspects to that, which I'm sure an awful lot of you will be familiar with anyway. But just to set the scene, men's mental health definitely remains an issue that's hard to address. Uh, it's one that's seen little male specific policy initially initiatives developed over the years. Um, myself and Peter have been working in this field now for getting on for 30 years, and it seems quite an intractable area. So whilst we've seen a, quite a lot of progress in areas related to men's physical health and at the physical health outcomes, men's mental health and well-being have seemed to be harder to address. And we see that, you know, men's suicide rates, for example, remain twice that of women's globally. And that difference, as we know, is even more marked in a lot of countries. So here in the UK, for example, it's a five-fold difference. Um, on top of that, there are concerns about hidden depression and anxiety in men. So whilst they may um, appear to be fewer in number than women in terms of rates of depression and anxiety, there's there's a lot of thinking that that is because a lot of men's depression and anxiety actually remains hidden. Um, and that the way that men present with what are called common mental health disorders like depression and anxiety are different from how women present and are therefore often um, not picked up. There are concerns in particular in terms of men's mental well-being about how men cope with emotional problems. So, for example, issues linked to relationship breakdown, access to children, redundancy, etc. Uh, they're less likely to utilise friends and relatives or professional help to deal with these sort of concerns and more likely to use what are termed acting out behaviours and approaches such as drinking, drugs, gambling, violence, etc. And a lot of that has been linked to particular aspects of masculinity. So society's expectations of what is expected of men and the difficulties that men encounter when those can't um, be lived up to. There's also some newer concerns emerging that haven't yet received too much attention in terms of research, policy and practice. Um, so examples here include things like postnatal depression in fathers, uh, an increase in um, attendance for men in relation to body image disorders, uh, and some of that linked to steroid abuse. And then things like the specific impact of COVID-19 on men's mental health, which is only just beginning to be sort of looked into and talked about. However, I think despite all of those sort of concerns, there's been an awful lot of work done in the last decade in particular that has provided examples of how successful men's health promotion initiatives can be developed and, and the various component parts of those. And I know that we'll hear about some of those um, initiatives today. But some other examples, things like work undertaken with older men through men's sheds, which is pretty widely known about now, work with younger men and middle-aged men, engaging men's mental health and well-being through sport, um, engaging with fathers through routine depression screening, like in Denmark, community-based initiatives for fathers, like some of the ones that have uh, uh, taken place in the UK and elsewhere, and then also engagement with men in relation to mental health and well-being through arts and music. And these are just some examples of some of the initiatives that have developed over the last sort of 20, 10 to 20 years. Um, and the work of Movember in funding and evaluating these sort of innovative interventions should definitely be flagged here and it's worth checking out. So important in all of those initiatives is 
taking a positive approach to working alongside men, sort of recognising the strengths that they bring in helping find solutions to often complex problems. And that really is what we're hoping for today. So the idea is that through both the presentations and the discussion that follows, we want to focus not only on the difficult and challenging things in relation to men's mental health and wellbeing, but also to look at what can be done in policy and practice to take the next steps to help improve things. So without any further ado, we'll move into the first presentation, um, which is that by Derek Griffiths, looking at men's, black men's mental health and wellbeing. Derek is founder and co-director of the Racial Justice Institute, founder and director of the Centre for Men's Health Equity and professor of health systems administration and oncology at Georgetown University. He's trained in psychology and public health. His program of research focuses on developing strategies to improve black men's health and to achieve racial, ethnic and gender equality and justice in health and well-being. We welcome him here today as Vice Chair of Global Action on Men's Health, and he's on the editorial boards of the American Journal of Men's Health and the International Journal of Men's Social and Community Health. He's a contributor to and lead editor of Men's Health Equity, which is a handbook, and he's the author of over 150 peer-reviewed manuscripts. So with all those accolades behind you, Derek, I'm very pleased, having known you for some time, to, uh, to hand over to you for the first presentation. Thank you, Steve. A very kind introduction and um, greetings from Bilbao. I'm here at a um, well-being conference on social change. So um, exciting to be talking about this positive work in terms of um, efforts to actually improve um, well-being in, in particularly young black men. Uh, let me get my slides queued up. And... Okay. So I titled this presentation, uh, Promoting Well-Being in Young Black Men, and I'm gonna focus and anchor my remarks on um, a project where I was a consultant, uh, Movember's Rooted and Rising Collective, which was a pilot program that I'll talk about in some depth. But I'm also going to um, expand on that a little bit and, and riff off of it a little bit to suggest some other things that we might do in future iterations of such uh, types of interventions. Uh, let me first say thank you to um, my team at the Center for Men's Health Equity. Um, we're less than a year in, I see a couple of them um, on who are watching now. So thank you for your continued support and our current funders. I also want to make sure that I acknowledge the Movember Foundation team and particularly those who worked on Rooted and Rising, um, Kimber Smith in particular, who was really the glue to this particular project. And um, Tom Ellis, the current uh, director of social impact campaigns and many others, Chris Denson, who was the program advisor for media business and creativity. Um, and certainly the, uh, the group of artists who were the, the anchor and the foundation of this particular project. So I'm starting with this quote um, that may be familiar to some and maybe not to others. Uh, quote from W.E.B. Du, e. du Bois and the Souls of Black Folk that she wrote um, almost 120 years ago, where he asked the question, how does it feel to be a problem? And he wrote these essays um, talking about the idea of um, and just really trying to characterize the ability to thrive amid um, really structural, political, um, social and economic adversity. And how do we understand how, particularly in this case, uh, Black Americans were, what were the conditions that they were struggling with and what were the things that they were doing um, to address those kinds of issues? This particular quote, I think, seems really uh, relevant to today because we often think of Black men, and particularly young Black men, as a population that are the problem, not that they have a problem and that they are also part of and have ideas and have opportunities to be part of the solution. And so that this sort of stuck with me as something that I think is an important foundation. And we see these rates of particular leading causes of death 
um, the rates of homicide um, as the number one cause, but in particular as it relates to this work, well, both, I think, actually, um, intentional self-harm and suicide being the third leading cause of death for, again, however you particularly characterize young Black men, um, but every in that age, all of these age groups from 15 to 34, um, I showed how the CDC tends to categorize the, the age groups. But I also want to make sure that I note that um, legal intervention or engagement with the police is a top 10, 10 leading cause of death for 15 to 19 year old and 10th for 20 to 25 year old black men. It's one of the few groups, I think Native American men or the young men are also the only other populations for which legal intervention, having had some involvement with the police, whether or not they were actually guilty or not, um, has is a leading cause of death. And so when we think about that in the context of the different things that we've seen in terms of the murders of young and older Black men um, and just the police context and how we think about that, there, a lot of the critique of how the police have engaged with young Black men has spoken to this idea that they are the problem and therefore need to be controlled and contained. So we tried to, with the, in collaboration with the Movember Foundation, it was really their work and idea. I was the one who really developed the curriculum. What we tried to do is develop and implement an accelerator program, uh, which is basically working with people who already are in the field but doing particular type of work. Um, and it was trying to equip 18 to 25 year old black male digital creators with the tools to increase their capacity to build successful businesses without compromising their well-being. So how do they continue to be very successful um, folks in whatever their particular chosen art was, where they have a significant social media following, but to infuse well-being content into that work? And how do they understand the, the culturally relevant, in terms of well-being, what does that really mean? Because it's a very abstract sort of concept. So how do they particularly understand the role of self-care and what can particular self-care behaviors can they particularly incorporate into their lives that they're choosing and that we're not being prescriptive about saying that you need to choose, you know, to define self-care or operationalize self-care for you in this way or that way. We gave them the content, we gave them a series of ideas and a context in which to operate and basically then suggested that they go forth and provided them the support and the context to decide how they wanted to define and operationalize self-care in their work and in the content that they were using and disseminating digitally. And so again, the third part is to create content that inspires and motivates their audiences to adopt behaviors that will improve their audience's well-being in addition to their own. Quickly, the program logic model, I'm not gonna go through this in ex exceptional detail, but the expert advisory board were basically myself and Chris Denson, um, who's an expert in digital media and author and um, just an amazing um, gentleman collaborator um, who was again, over the business side of things and um, provided a lot of support and, and uh, the individualizing of the curriculum on thinking about the business of digital creativity and then I developed more of the um, framework for thinking about self-care, um, mental well-being, and utilize the uh, framework called the Information Motivation Behavioral Skills Model to anchor the framework and to give some guidance and structure to that. Um, the 10 digital creators were provided a financial stipend and 11-week training program um, of about 30 hours. They created, each of them, each of the 10 of them created two pieces of self-care content that they again use in their own uh, way and in their own sort of, um, in their own platform and their own ways of, of disseminating and thinking about their own work and how they built that into their content and curriculum. And then we also saw that the goals and the outcomes were really to influence the creators themselves, but also then to influence their audiences. So these are pictures of the 10 um, young black men. They were selected, um, they're all from the, the larger um, Los Angeles area. They, the plan for this project was to start it there um, because there was already sort of a cohort of folks that have been working in that particular geographic area. Um, the, these young black men were selected in part because they had such a large social media following collectively, you see 1.5 million followers. So the, again, the idea was to get past some of the challenges that we typically face with uh, interventions to think about how 
they need to incorporate things like um, this kind of creative uh, self-care curriculum and content into and mental well-being into their contact into their content and have impactful storytelling and those kinds of things as a way to do the work that they're doing. Um, part of the work is also that the evaluation of the, of the project was done through a mixed methods approach done by um, uh, RTI International, who was contracted to do that work. They did um, in-depth interviews with, um, again, the, the 10 young men, um, some of the other staff members like myself or, or consultants. Um, they did an experiment basically where they recruited uh, followers of the cohort member to, to look at their responses to the different things, um, content analysis of the videos, and then uh, description of audience engagement as the four tools that they used. What we found um, in that work, or what they found, was that the program content um, did have some, some significant effects, again, with a small sample of, a of 10 people, but again, you're looking at um, so many different data points, and the content was larger that the, the viewers themselves, uh, so if we think about the beneficiary audience, not just the young men themselves, the audience um, gave more thought to their own well-being after watching videos that actually spoke to that particular type of content. They uh, increased their sense of how to engage in self-care, so gave them concrete tools, and so that translated to those young men. Uh, inspired viewers to improve their own well-being um, increase the importance of self-care and help them, uh, again, they judge that self-care is more important for themselves. And the viewers were two, four, two, point, two and a half times more likely to intend to engage in self-care going forward um, after watching those videos versus watching videos that had their standard, the, that the artists had in their essentially standard curriculum and content. Um, what was striking also, and that was a little unique, was that we were surprised that the audience found the creators more relatable and interesting when they included the self-care content versus, again, their already very successful content and curriculum and information that they had um, included in their, in their products thus far. And so the fact that it made them more interesting and relevant to their audiences, they seem to be more relatable. Um, and it was seen as a positive that they actually prioritize their own well-being, um, increase interest in their content and the types of things that they were doing. And they were more likely to see that, that particular content or that type of content um, as relevant to them more so than the creator's other con content, which we're calling the control content here. And so program, you know, these kinds of content was significantly more engaging. They actually got more likes, comments, and shares then again, the content that they have been developing or continue to develop um, during the same time. So um, this inaugural piece, again, these were 20 pieces that they came up with. In the interest of time, I'm not gonna show the brief video. It's about three minutes. So um, we can show it later if there's, if there's time and availability for that. But I do wanna close with um, a couple of comments from um, the Director of Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion for Movember about the importance of this project and why they saw it as so important. And he said, he said uh, Jerry Jones said, Rooted in Rising is a cornerstone by which we'll build an engagement strategy rooted in equity, diversity, and inclusion, particularly of Black men in America and with men of African descent, African and Caribbean descent more broadly. And one of the key four, key tools in this or one of the key sort of points in this is that they centered the voices and experiences of the men in the project of young black men and again saw them as not just um, a, a, a population with a problem and that were a problem in the way that we tend to engage in, and characterize young black men in our country as is really thinking about the fact that no they were actually replete with um, strengths creativity and other assets that we could use as the foundation to then actually um, develop this kind of content that would have more influence on their larger audience whether they were black men or not and as the director of Ed, um, equity diversity and inclusion his hope was that november would continue to build frameworks and um, conducting equitable engagement and forging partnerships that allow them to continue to do this work um, in a larger context. So these are my next steps or what I'm thinking. Um, we're still chatting and November is still deciding what they wanna do. So I wanna make it clear that this isn't something that um, November has, has endorsed or anything, but 
I do think it's important and noteworthy that we want to, you know, of course, take the next steps of refining the program based on the lessons learned, expand the pilot, and see if we can do it in different cities. Um, but I think that one of the pieces that that's missing is going back to the initial sort of thoughts about Du Bois is that we need to better understand the structural context, the things like anti-Black gender structural racism. And I use all of those descriptors to be thoughtful about the precise ways that we think about what it means that if you think about the, the unique ways that we think about the stereotypes of young Black men, um, that it combines the, these different pieces in a unique way that we have to better understand. And so this idea of intersectionality, how we play that out is an important foundation for understanding what these to, to give language voice and clarity for the young black men about what they're experiencing and why they're experiencing these particular challenges and which parts of those challenges are they in control of and which parts of those challenges are structural conditions that they need to be aware of and that they themselves by doing self-care may not be able to overcome but they certainly can try to in their own lives mitigate that and work with others by organizing and so forth to actually engage in work that is going to help address those kinds of issues. And then the last thing for me is I think to strengthen potentially the focus on connectedness and collective well-being in addition to the individual level of self-care. Um, one of the things that the young men talked about a lot was um, in the video and in other spaces was the importance and the power of just knowing that they were in this network of these young black men that they had never met before um, and that they were struggling with the same types of problems, but they were connected in understanding these issues in a similar way and trying to work together for um, not only having successful, you know, small businesses, but also, you know, collectively trying to improve themselves and others. So thank you very much. Thank you, Derek. And um... Thank you very much for sticking so well to time as well. That's great. Um, in terms of sort of a clarification question, there was one popped up in the chat, which was um, about the sort of rollout of the programme. But I think you addressed that in your second to last slide that you're hoping to expand it to, uh, to other cities. So I th think that probably covers that. But if not, we could come back to that during the discussion, it may be that there's a wider discussion point at the end about how to transfer um, knowledge learnt and how well that knowledge transfers into other contexts and settings. So, um, great, yep, someone wants it in Philadelphia, so they are, there's your next trip, Derek. Okay, um, we'll move on then, so that we can make sure we leave plenty of time for discussion at the end. And I'm pleased to um, welcome Cody Ranganisi, who is a Senior Programme Officer at Equimundo Centre, which was Promundo for Masculinities and Social Justice. He's been lead author of two reports in Equimundo's Making the Connection series, one which details links between masculinities and men's health behaviours and the other which explores its connections with males' ability to cope with trauma. In that role, he partners with organisations to design, implement and evaluate gender transformative projects aimed at fostering critical reflection on masculinities and gender norms. He leads Ecomundo's work in the United States, which includes a comprehensive sexuality education programme designed for older adolescents in Washington, DC. And he also manages several violence prevention projects, working primarily with fathers and their sons in Jordan and Kurdistan region of Iraq. Um, so welcome, Cody, and your presentation is on men, masculinities and male trauma. So I'll hand over to you. Thanks, Cody. Great, thank you so much, Steve, and uh, good evening, good afternoon. Um, and good morning to those. I was pleased to see some familiar faces on the on the chat, and welcome to uh, those uh, joining us from around the the world. Um, as Steve had mentioned, my uh, conversation today is around masculinities and male trauma, um, and I am a senior program officer at Equimundo. Um, and as this may be the first uh, of hearing of ours, uh, us and our new identity formerly Promundo US, 
Um, we made that switch last month. So Equimundo, um, same mission uh, and commitment to gender equality and social justice um, by transforming intergenerational patterns of harm and promoting patterns of care, empathy, and accountability. Um, so a little bit about us, um, certainly the research programs and advocacy piece is continuing on from Promundo US within these buckets of work thematically. Um, today, I'm pleased to present the findings of our new report recently launched called Masculinities and Male Trauma, um, where myself and two co-authors, Henny Slay and Warren Spielberg, explore the links between masculine norms and masculinity and the experience of trauma and adversity among boys and men, um, and really look at the interpersonal, individual, and uh, institutional links that sort of perpetuate the inability to adequately and healthily cope with trauma. So as you may know, um, we've done some, uh, you know, some more of these reports in the Making the Connection series, um, the first of which was around violence. Um, Steve had mentioned the second around men's health and, you know, thanks to Global Action on Men's Health, as well as Movember for supporting us there um, and, and others. We're on our fifth now and hopefully some more to come in the future. And so the outline of this report is sort of starting out as a conceptual framework. As most of you may know, you know, varying degrees of or varying definitions of trauma and adversity um, in the field of, you know, psychosocial support, mental health, psychology. And so really just laying that framework to say, what are we talking about here and why should we be caring? Um, the main part of the report is split into three uh, thematic sections, um, really detailing the common experiences of trauma among male and men and boys uh, across the globe. The first being assault and abuse, the second war and violence, and then the third racism, ethnic discrimination and oppression. Um, and today we're really going to focus on the second, given the relevance across the world in conflict settings and post-conflict settings, specifically in the Middle East, Europe, with Ukraine, um, and uh, other uh, conflicts around the world. The last is uh, the recommendations for action. So in today's presentation, I'll go over sort of the headlines, but there's far more uh, in, the, in the report that you can read after the presentation. So just sort of setting the scene and the scope of the problem, um, you know, I think most of us have an idea of trauma, uh, but I did provide a definition, as I said. It's, it's a bit of a you know, debated topic in some circles. So we use trauma as a psychological state, state uh, developed when the experience of threat overwhelms an individual's coping resources. Um, and so as you can imagine, conflict, war, and violence really do um, inflict trauma and adversity among uh, many folks who are involved in battle and war, but then also civilians as well. So the data on the left-hand side of your screen just shows from the Images Afghanistan report in 2017. Um, and so this is a, a survey done by Promundo at the time, the International Men and Gender Equality Survey, which some of you may be familiar with, just showing sort of the, the prevalence of trauma or events that could cause trauma. Um, so, you know, living as an IDP or refugee, um, you know, physical harm, emotional harm. So just sort of, you know, highlighting the, the ubiquity across all conflicts as well. Um, and so this is definitely a problem that everyone should be uh, paying attention to and not only affecting those involved in conflict uh, directly, but also those indirectly involved. So as you can imagine, the mental health toll is severe. Um, we've, in the report, concentrated on subgroups being children associated with armed forces and armed groups, adult male participation in war, and then non-conflict homicide. Um, and so, so yeah, some of the common 
mental health consequences across the board, um, PTSD, so post-traumatic stress disorder, survival's guilt for soldiers who may have lost comrades or for fellow soldiers, but survived themselves, and then just generalized trauma from witnessing, causing, or experiencing violence them themselves or inflicting on others, which results in a wide uh, range of different consequences from depression, chronic pain, anxiety, behavioral disorders, and suicidal ideation, particularly with the children associated with these armed forces, really disruptions in psychological and social development for them. So as you're thinking about the life course model um, and sort of early childhood development to adolescence, this really is uh, you know, crucial for their, their development. And then we also looked at not only from a conflict, you know, direct conflict lens, but sort of the collective trauma in indoctrination and identity and the culture inside of armed groups or formalized military and sort of how that would impact uh, men and boys' mental health. Lastly, the reintegration challenges across the globe, whether formal or informal uh, conflict, the reintegration challenges remain sort of the same, isolation, stigma, and really a lack of social protections and services, which I'll talk about in a little bit. Um, so generally, um, this was a, a study, you know, a, a consolidation of research done across the globe. So we did have to generalize a bit, um, but certainly applicable, I think, to many settings. Um, so as we talk about masculinities and conflict, I think one of the useful sort of tools is looking at internalized masculinities at the core. So really what we mean by this, some of these uh, hegemonic masculinities or sort of as some would consider toxic masculinities would really uh, you know, include self-sufficiency, to be a defender or a protector that's really um, that's really central to the role of a soldier. Um, emotional stoicism, strength, honor, pride, all of these I, I don't think are unfamiliar to us when we think of soldiers or combatants. And really what this means in terms of a trauma lens and where it, uh, you know, conflict and trauma intersect is not acknowledging or they're minimizing the trauma that they're experiencing or, you know, in some cases, glorifying those traumatic events um, and really, you know, that self-sufficiency point of view to say, I've experienced this, but it means nothing because I'm strong and can, can deal with this. Um, and they're not seeking available services if they're, if they're being uh, offered. Um, and then we tried to not only look at the individual manifestations, but on an institutional lens, so looking primarily at you know, uh, military groups as well as the services that they provide. Um, in the US, the Veterans Affairs um, holds most of our services for soldiers in other contexts. Usually there's some branch of a, of a public health or health framework, but there are limited or inexistent mental health su uh, support services specifically for active duty or informal groups. Um, and so there, even the existing services are not very gendered in the sense of really tailoring their services to men and boys uh, and their specific needs. In the work culture of you know, the military, there's a hyper-masculine culture uh, usually that incentivizes strength and with roles and promotions and retaliation of weakness. So it just sort of perpetuates the idea that you must be strong in order to be in the military uh, or armed groups. Um, and then, you know, from a societal lens, the continued exposure to violence in media could trigger some response uh, that maybe was hidden from trauma. And usually criminal justice systems are the response to any behavioral um, disorders moving forward. So the headlines here really is that notions of masculinity are omnipresent in all aspects of peace and security, from the survivors to the perpetrators, and all of these 
sort of hegemonic masculine norms that we know about are, are very present in the way that men acknowledge or don't acknowledge their trauma and furthermore seek or don't seek services. And we know that individual behaviors matter, but we really need to shift the focus to the in, uh, institutional and societal norms and frameworks that are set up to support men and boys. We know from our research and literature that violence leads to violence. The opposite is also true about caring men do lead to a new generation of caring men. So really embracing that um, and nurturing that. And really, as we move forward, thinking about a trauma-informed and gender transformative approach, specifically in the context of conflict, but across uh, multiple uh, varieties. Last slide here, just looking at some recommendations for, you know, there's recommendations for everyone, basically in the report from the different groups, but looking at this slide here, from a research point of view, I'd really love to read some research on the protective factors associated with male uh, help-seeking behaviors, primarily soldiers or combatants. What, what are they doing that can, can be replicated um, as a protective factor. And then for policymakers and governmental institutions, really looking at the national frameworks and health systems, targeting active duty service members, veterans, ex-combatants around the utility and cultural and logistical barriers for accessing mental health services. Um, and then finally, just more training and a very intentional gendered lens for any social services that are available for active duty or veterans. So that's all from me. Thank you so much. Uh, my email is here and I'll be sure to share the slides uh, after the... That is fantastic. And thank you again for sticking so well to time. This is making my life quite easy so far. Um, I haven't seen any clarifying questions so unless anyone wants to type one into either the chat or the q a very quickly then my suggestion is that we move on and we can have a, a larger conversation and discussion at the end if that's okay so the final presentation today is on the mind fit toolkit and digital resources and that's been given to us very kindly by TC Carling, who is the president and CEO of the Canadian Men's Health Foundation, which is a national non-profit providing information, resources and motivation for men and their families to lead healthier lives. So under TC's leadership, the foundation is building an integrated approach to men's health that involves both mental and physical health. He and his team are committed to connecting mind and mind and body health together to deliver programs and services to giving men a full slate of resources to improve their well-being. Previously, TC has gained leadership experience holding executive roles with Canucks Sports and Entertainment, the GSL Group, and most recently as president and CEO for Fortius Sport and Health. We've also got experience in the non-profit sector, serving on the board of directors for Global Action on Men's Health, Anxiety Canada, Big Brothers of Greater Vancouver, and of course, the Canadian Men's Health Foundation. So I shall hand over to you, TC, for the third and final presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Steve and uh, Cody and Derek. Well done on both of your presentations. And Thank you for sharing your insights. And it was uh, nice to hear some uh, commonalities uh, throughout those presentations and also um, some differences too as to uh, the strategies that the Canadian Men's Health Foundation has taken on um, in particular these last 18 months when it comes to uh, men's mental health. Um, as I said earlier, grateful to join uh, many thought leaders uh, from around the world trying to improve the health outcomes and lives of men and families and in particular, improving their mental health. Over the next uh, 10 minutes or so, I'll just give you a, a really high level overview of uh, who we are. For those of you who don't know, the mental health issue that we are uh, focused on at this time, what our strategy has been, and some of the resources that we've built out 
uh, over the last 18 months. With limited time, I'm going to go over uh, the resources and assets uh, fairly quickly. I'll talk about our strategy, uh, but not so much on the granular uh, statistics at this point, but I'm happy to do so um, offline or in the 30-minute window we have for conversations. But really, we'll talk about the journey we've been on the last 18 months uh, to build out and develop uh, digital resources that men and their families uh, can benefit from here in Canada and, and globally. Just very high level, uh, the national uh, nonprofit of the Canadian Men's Health Foundation was founded uh, coming up on nearly a decade ago by Order of Canada recipient, Dr. Goldenberg. And we took uh, from the onset um, a different approach to uh, public health or uh, uh, men's health with 72% of men in Canada deemed unhealthy uh, or, our organization was primarily focused on chronic illness prevention. That work is ongoing and will continue and will continue to be um, the foundation with which the foundation is uh, built on. But we also want to make sure we treat our brain like we treat the rest of our body and uh, complement the two of them with programs that can support one another. Three of the logos on the screen right now, the Move for Your Mental Health, the MindFit Toolkit, and the Don't Change Much podcast I will speak to in the next seven or eight minutes, uh, none of those programs existed one year ago today. So we're proud of the work that we've been doing um, and, and really the strategy of meeting men where they are and becoming and continuing to be a credible source of online information. For those who aren't aware, uh, we have been a digital uh, organization from, from our inception, uh, taking research and testing to engage unhealthy men and encourage better self-care offering these programs at a cost-effective way. Uh, cost-effective as far as um, building them and executing them, but free in every sense for any of our users. There's absolutely no cost whatsoever to any of our resources, and I'll speak a little bit more to that in a moment, but really providing men uh, the flexibility, convenience, and privacy of online male-centric health information has been really important. Uh, we were uniquely positioned uh, as a digital uh, resource for men. Little did we know the last uh, two and a half years just how uniquely positioned we were. But uh, I'm happy to say and proud to say that our services uh, were available, accessible, and needed uh, even more so over the last two years, both for the mental and physical assets and resources that we've been offering. And that uh, speaks to the fact that our numbers, uh, our engagement numbers for uh, socially distanced Canadians and those uh, abroad have continued to grow. And I think something that's really important in this um, fourth square is uh, there's a lot of noise. There's a lot of information out there, um, some of it credible, some of it not. But people who come to our, uh, our resources know that they can get credible content, scientifically proven methods for improvement. Uh, and this is really important with so many inaccurate messages. Uh, in so many different places in our online world these days. As far as strategies and partnerships, partnerships are very important to our organization uh, as a small to medium-sized uh, nonprofit. So primarily we partner with government, corporate partners, and or individuals of credibility that can help elevate our foundation in one of four ways. Uh, one of them being a value and kind offering, an amplification of our key messages or our reach, you know, uh, uh, something Derek was speaking about, we have a national champions program and uh, you'll see some of their faces in just a moment. And it seems like um, it's a very similar strategy and I look, look forward to learning more from him uh, around their social influencer strategy. And something that stuck out from what he said that uh, stuck with me was not only uh, did those influencers uh, benefit the people they were speaking to, but they saw the benefit as well as far as more engagement. So that's what we're trying to do with people who can amplify our message. We also partner with subject matter expertise uh, and experts in this, in this case, in the mental health space. And of course, funding and revenue is critical to our sustainability, our growth and our ability to bring these resources uh, to those who need them. As far as the problem that we are trying to uh, improve, um, we're really focused on the universal rise of stress and anxiety and other mental health issues in Canada. Uh, we know, as uh, Steve mentioned at the beginning, that men are less likely to speak uh, or seek help, pardon me, uh, they're less likely to talk about their struggles and they're more likely to be uh, reckless or act on their thoughts in an unhealthy or dismissive way. Often this is because of the uh, masculine norms, health-related stigma, and uh, we are trying to break down those barriers uh, so men can talk more openly and freely 
about uh, their anxiety, depression, or mental health challenges. At a very high level, some of the statistics in Canada at this time, 41% of Canadians identify as struggling with anxiety. 80% of the men are stressed at work. 60% are losing sleep over it. Uh, one in five adults screened for uh, increased symptoms of depression and anxiety uh, or post-traumatic stress as a result of the pandemic. And some of the behaviors that come from that, 60% worrying about finances, 30% uh, feeling more moderate to severe anxiety about returning to the pre-pandemic world and nearly 30% binge drinking. Uh, despite all that, and to echo something Steve said off the top, our statistics show that only 30% uh, of the people who use mental health support services in Canada are men. Uh, I think we can speak with confidence. That's not because uh, it's, a, it's a lower number of people who are struggling, but rather a lower number of people seeking the help that they need. As uh, stated in the introduction there, we are really uh, committed to trying to treat our brain like we treat the rest of our body. And as an organization that's been focused on chronic illness prevention um, for nearly a decade, uh, we thought it was uh, very important that we build out a robust, equally robust mental health program. Uh, and we've started that uh, over the last 18 months. And um, the, uh, the circle on the left really sort of takes you on the journey that we're committed to trying to take our audience on. Uh, first and foremost, we want to clearly communicate with our target audience, which I'll speak about in a moment. We want to build awareness of the problem. We want to normalize feelings. Um, that's actually a um, terminology that we've decided to uh, proactively use in our organization. Oftentimes, um, the term stigma or reducing stigma is the way people speak, and that's a very impactful way to do so. We've decided to use the term uh, normalize because we know that for many, many people, especially in the areas that we're focused on, um, stress and anxiety in particular, uh, these are very normal feelings. And so how do we make sure that people know that uh, that is the case? We wanna educate uh, men on, on the problem and that they're not alone. And then, event, and then finally, we want them to be able to take action. We wanna launch resources and campaigns for uh, better health improvement. Our target audience is men, Canadian men aged 30 to 50. Uh, and to echo some of the things um, that have been said already, these are men that feel uh, stressed, anxious, or lonely due to work, family, or financial pressures. They might feel the weight of the world on their shoulders. Uh, they feel isolated uh, or anxious about the uncertainty, in particular around the future economic landscape or the health-related issues across the world at this time. And we uh, are committed to being an authoritative source um, for not only the men, but their families that want uh, to support them. And that's why um, also part of our primary um, target audience are people uh, who have influence over a man uh, and the lifestyle uh, and habits that they choose. That could be a loved one, a partner, a child, and so on. And in the orange uh, box there, again, just to reiterate what was on the last screen, everything that we bring to our target, target audience must build awareness, must educate, and must be able to provide an action item. So this, this exactly this time last year, uh, June 1st of last year, we launched a um, Move for Your Mental Health month-long campaign focused on supporting men's mental health. It was a significant step for our organization, uh, similar to Derek's um, Social Influencers Program. Uh, for those that are not Canadian uh, on our webinar today, each of those faces on there are well-known Canadians. Um, the second from the left with the Canadian flag on his chest is Simon Whitfield. He's the first ever Olympic gold medalist in the triathlon and the three-time uh, Olympic medalist. He carried Canada's flag at the London Olympics in 2012. There's professional hockey players, uh, people who work on a show called Hockey Night in Canada, which is the most watched television program in Canada, national broadcasters, and people with lived experience. Um, we wanted to ensure that we partnered with the right people for the reasons we've uh, said before. This was going to be our first step into this space. It was important that uh, our audience uh, uh, knew that the, the conversations we were going to have were trustworthy, and they would be engaging, and they would get something out of it. And that's why we had four distinct themes last June as part of our engagement strategy. We wanted people to come away uh, better informed, um, feeling less alone because of the subject matter experts and the men and women across this country that they trust and they see on their television screens uh, on a regular basis. And all of these resources uh, are and were free. Uh, we used YouTube last year as our engagement channel. And we had four distinct themes last year, 
first and foremost, to how to start a conversation about mental health. The gentleman in the top left with the black and white suit on uh, is a longtime professional hockey player who is a mental health advocate across Canada, uh, having lost uh, a teammate and a friend uh, to severe depression and suicide back in 2011. He's taken his legacy and wants to make it uh, meaningful. So that was the strategy uh, last year and the results showed with a 40% increase in, in new visitors to our website, um, thousands and thousands of engagements that uh, we knew right away, we were seeing the metrics in real time uh, that we had something that we wanted to build on. And that's why we knew this time last year that we had a repeatable model. The three things in particular that we wanted to repeat was a month long campaign. So we have just started that again this year. Uh, we wanted to have the same theme of uh, partnering uh, physical activity for mental, mental health improvement. And we wanted to have a speakers event. We wanted people to speak openly um, about their challenges and about improvement and inspire others across Canada to do the same. So this June, uh, five days ago, I suppose now, uh, we started our second annual Move for Your Mental Health campaign. Again, a 30-day campaign focused on the exact same things, the rising impact of stress and anxiety on men and families, the, the impact that the pandemic has had on the physical and mental well-being uh, for all Canadians. And we want to educate men that uh, by moving and getting physically active, especially as the weather gets better across Canada, getting outside, getting in nature, that this can have a profound impact on their mental well-being. But uh, we didn't want to have an exact repeat of last year, so we have evolved it, uh, most notably by the launch of a podcast, which launches tomorrow. We'll speak about that in a moment. We've also partnered with a, a well-known fitness club um, with over 100,000 members uh, to amplify our message and to provide um, family-friendly activity. And again, all of these are uh, free, there's absolutely no sign up required. It's about building a social connection, inspiring people for this entire month uh, to get healthier. I'm happy to say that the podcast launches tomorrow. I'll speak to that in a moment. And that fundraising for us is already up as of the 5th of June or 6th of June, five times year over year. So people want to support these programs in a meaningful way. Taking the exact same strategy of meeting men uh, where they are, of using uh, social influencers and people of uh, credibility and notoriety from across Canada. The Don't Change Much podcast launches tomorrow. There will be four episodes in June. All four of them have been pre-recorded. Uh, the faces, once again, uh, at the bottom of the screen are well-known Canadians, um, the national team soccer coach, a uh, country music superstar, television hosts, and subject matter experts. Uh, please download the podcast tomorrow on your favorite podcast subscriber. would love your feedback. Four episodes this month, and there will be one episode per month uh, from July to December. And it's really just another opportunity to meet men where they are, uh, have conversations, um, have people feel like they can be in a safe environment and uh, take something away for better mental well-being. But our most robust mental health tool and our biggest step into um, the mental health space was this past January. So at that point, we were about six or eight months into our mental health um, product offerings. And this was a significant step for us. We partnered with Canada's largest telecom, uh, TELUS, who's also the largest virtual healthcare provider in Canada on the MindFit toolkit. We wanted to provide men the opportunity to step into the space in whatever way made them feel most comfortable. That could be as little as a 90 second uh, soundscape. That could be as little as um, uh, meditating for men who don't normally meditate with the voices of well-known Canadians that they, uh, they respect. But it also included the anxiety screening tool, the Oasis anxiety screening tool. Of that, 78% of the men who took the screening tool on our website screened for severe anxiety, 22% screened for mild to moderate anxiety. Uh, the challenge is real, the issue in front of us is real, and it will be a long road uh, into overall health improvement. But, but by partnering with TELUS, we have an enormous reach now across Canada. They are offering one-to-one -one virtual counseling opportunities, and we are providing that at uh, no cost to people who would not otherwise be able to afford it. Uh, there is absolutely no cost, no email acquisition. It is completely private. It is not a traditional marketing where you have to sign up by email. 
we set out to do something that we considered barrier free to provide men and families the support that they needed. And again, we did it in a tone and style um, that would normalize these feelings. So these are digital ads that you would have seen across Canada, uh, trying to normalize uh, the use of the language, take care of your mental wellness. It's the manly thing to do, manage your stress, not the other way around and so forth. One minute, PC. Yeah, no problem. This is my second to last slide. Thank you. Uh, we want to profile well-known Canadians. So these are men of uh, credibility in this country, Olympic champions, hockey players, and so forth, telling their own story about their own mental wellness and their own challenges. And finally, the last slide, just on digital engagement, um, I just want to show that uh, what we believe is happening is that our mental health programming is driving much stronger engagement. So January 1st to May 31st, year over year, so that's this year versus last year when the mental health programming started. Uh, our two English, primary English websites are up uh, 45% in new users. We're driving all mental health programming to our CMHF website, and it's seen a 100% increase in page views and new users. And for us, that's telling us that the message is important, the message is working, and that we must continue to build it out. We must continue to meet men where they are. We are strong believers that with the right resources, healthier men make healthier families and much healthier communities. Thanks again for this opportunity. I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Thanks very much, TC. And thanks again to all, all three of our speakers. So, so there's a few things that are coming up in the q and um, I'll pick up on some of them. So the, the first one seems to be a discussion around um, transferability of these type of initiatives and interventions. And linked to that was a, a comment about the research evidence in relation to influencers and the fact that local influencers seem to have um, a greater impact than sort of national figures and influencers. I don't know, TC, do you want to take that last point, given that your presentation was a lot about influencers? And then maybe if Derek and Cody want to chip in on the transferability aspect. Yes, I will. Thanks, Steve. So uh, the, the National Champions Program, as we call it, which sounds quite familiar to um, or quite similar to Derek's uh, Social Influencers Program, is, is really about we can only have so much reach with our current assets and our current uh, resources. And so how can we get people of credibility, well-known people across our country, to amplify those messages for us. Um, when you hear your favorite professional hockey player or television presenter speaking about their own mental wellness, it, it really resonates with the people. And I heard that in Derek's and I took some notes as he was speaking about, it does, it, it seemed like there was a two, two way street. One was they were helping the people that they were helping, but the feedback that they were getting was that their, their content, if you will, or their social influence was even more engaging. And so that's really something that we've been working on um, this year, our goal is to add three uh, additional national champions. And something that's important to us as well is about uh, the diversity of those champions. So we can speak to uh, a number of different audiences in different places in a different tone and style. We've added one national champion already this year. His, his profile was on our screen, Kelly Rudy. He is a mental health advocate across Canada having raised three adult daughters, one with severe anxiety. Um, he will be part of our second podcast around Father, uh, Father's Day. Um, we'll add another uh, social influencer uh, in uh, July on, uh, uh, who brings different, we have a clear criteria of what those influencers must be able to do. Some of them bring social media strength, some of them bring presentation strength, some of them bring national presence strength, etc. But I think, um, I agree, as we step into different, more uh, distinct uh, cultures, I think having people that will speak specifically to those audiences uh, will be really important for them to have the impact that we need them to have. Yeah, I think that point about diversity and sort of horses for courses, you know, having the right approach for, for different groups of men is, is really interesting. We'll never have a one size fits all. Um, and I guess that sort of links in perhaps to the transferability as well. And I don't know whether Derek or Cody, you, you wanna say anything about the transferability of the work that you presented into sort of different contexts? Yeah, well, I, I see 
I mean, I think that these, you know, sort of TC's approach and, and the Canadian Men's Health Forum and what we did with Movember as complementary, not necessarily that it's a it's a both and to me rather than an either or, because I think it changes the norms in a very different way when you're able to see these national figures speak to these kinds of issues and incorporate them in their lives and show the importance of it. Because um, again, you have to think about when you're trying to change norms, you're not just trying to change the men themselves, you're trying to change the people in their networks and so forth. So if their partners, their mothers, fathers, uncles, you know, sisters see these messages and resonate with them and even share them with the, the men themselves, the young men that may be the target of this particular or focused population of a particular type of intervention, that kind of normative change is really what we're looking for. So I think it really speaks to things at multiple levels more so than, than necessarily feeling like you have to choose or make a false choice between a national sort of nationally visible and recognizable figure and those that are local. Um, I do think, I mean, again, with the small pilot, it just seemed like, you know, it's kind of proof of principle that, you know, it does seem to work. And, and I think, again, the, it was great that they captured some of the, I'll say unintended, um, I'm sure intended, unintended benefits that it actually helped to improve their business, or helped to improve their relatability, that those kinds of things and just the spirit of the structure, I think, is transferable clearly you you know you don't do sort of apples to apples you kind of see what in context actually is is transferable to those spaces but i think the core principles and structure does seem to be a recipe that could be utilized elsewhere before i bring you in cody there's a specific question for you derek about um involving managed care organizations to fund participants who are who are their members in, in relation to scaling it up. Um, do you think yeah, that would be I, useful? I think it would absolutely be useful. It certainly hasn't been something that we thought about or um, considered before, but I love the idea. I mean, I think the other thing that could be more clearly um, connected that I think TC's program does probably better than what we did, um, again, in my collaboration with Movember, is connecting them to resources that if they actually do have you know, um, mental health problems that they actually, if it's beyond just sort of promoting, you know, positive mental well-being, that there actually are mental health needs that they have, how do we make sure that they get directed to resources and so forth? And so I think having it within a managed care setting where that's very more clearly tied to, okay, let's make sure that we have those messages that are going to connect you to those resources that are available within a managed care setting. I think the, having those tools that both change norms as well as direct people to, who need them to resources, because a lot of people, when they have a challenge, they don't know where to go, what to do with those kinds of things. So I think that's a great idea. Great, thanks, Derek. Cody, do you, do you have anything to add either on the influencers question or the transferability question? Yeah, not too much. And maybe just to piggyback off of Derek's last point there around sort of, yeah, service providers. I think it's one thing to get men and boys to sort of access the services if they exist, but then also have trained service providers that I think don't reinforce those negative stereotypes of you know, emotional stoicism and, and strength and honor and all of those things that we've been talking about here. So I think from my perspective, sort of the once you're entering into a facility or even an informal support network of friends and family, that there's not that sort of retaliation, whether implicit or explicit, of seeking those that support. So I think, yeah, just in terms of going to the sort of service provider, institutional and societal levels, it's, it, it is important as well, not only from an interpersonal sort of, yeah, influencer uh, aspect. And just really quickly, um, not just because you're moderating, Steve, but I think your, early, your work on like the don't care, should care dichotomy and, and helping people to understand that framework of, we have these competing narratives around men's health and masculinities that we don't sort of recognize how those things are, co are competing 
and that men are supposed to navigate both of those simultaneously when they're actually conflicting, that those kinds of things are really important as we, and I think Cody's work speaks to that very directly, um, not necessarily framed in that language, but I think it speaks to exactly what you had described, you know, in your qualitative work before. Yeah, thanks, Sarah. Um, so someone's raised an interesting issue, sort of putting you all on the spot, whether or not you could think of one or two national and global policy goals in relation to men's mental health. So thinking about what global actions um, advocacy, advocacy agenda should be because advocacy was another issue that came up quite a bit in the chat and the Q&A. So what, what might Global Action's advocacy agenda look like? What would the policy goals be? So one, one quick idea is that there are national, some, some countries, it's a small number as I understand it now, that are starting to include well-being goals or well-being as a national metric um, that they're using to guide policy. Um, again, much in the same way that we guide policy around economic indicators that they're actually starting to use those. So I think if we were to you know, push that, it's, it's more of sort of a gender mainstreaming sort of approach where it may not be obviously about gender, but it is starting to recognize all of the other factors that are very important in the well in sort of a well-being sort of picture. Um, so I think that's one at least place to potentially start. Um, Cody or TC? Yeah, sure. I, I was just going to say, I, I think um, something that Derek picked up on from my, my presentation is, I think this would be where I think we need to continue to build out that, I mean, the healthcare system around the world is very diverse and, and complicated, and we have our own system here and our own our own strengths and our own challenges in Canada. But I mean, I think many organizations can do a really good job of building awareness of a problem, of educating people on how to get better. But if someone steps into your space and they're willing to take the next step, there needs to be resources there. And in this case, I'm talking really granular, like one to one, some type of an opportunity to talk to somebody. Um, and so I think um, partnering with the right people or generating the right corporate revenue or whatever is required to actually, or government revenue to actually build out uh, the resources that are there for men once they step into the space and actually ask for the help. And staying consistent to sort of my topic in this webinar around conflict and, and militaries, I think one of the things as I was doing the research for this report, just the lack of data and just websites out there for active service military and or veterans um, was a bit surprising. And I think even those that do exist have many shortcomings logistically as well as sort of acceptability. And so I think, you know, in a specific country context, doing a, a sort of framework exercise of identifying services that are available for active military and veterans, and also making sure that barriers do not exist. Simple barriers like, you know, the amount of time that you served uh, or that you were honorably discharged from service or, you know, some of those barriers that really are restricting folks from, from accessing those services, you know, obviously pay and accessibility is another whole thing and, and very country dependent on, on, you know, social support and welfare and stuff like that. But yeah, I think it's, it's identifying those services, the service landscape at this point, because I, I don't think that's very clear. The only quick thing I also wanted to add is I think we have to recognize, and I think our, our collectively our three presentations speak and just the, the topic itself speaks to the fact that we have to think about policy change, but in the context of culture change, because you're not going to change policies that are not consistent with the culture. So you have to figure out how you're going to make the ground fertile for the policy to actually even get considered in a particular context 
And so, and even say, you know, context, not just nationally, but even say in a military context, that if you don't actually create the ground, the knowledge, the, the awareness, the norms within the organization, that this is something that is, you know, frankly, acceptable and, and normative and in a way that is actually not inconsistent with the, the values or that is challenging the values in a positive way, then you're not going to get the traction that's necessary to actually have the uptake of the policy, even if it's passed. So I think there's, I think what you're seeing here in, in the work that we do, and I know, frankly, in the, in the, and I don't know why I feel like I'm a commercial for you today, Steve, but for the, for the journal, but I think a lot of the, what the, a lot of the uniqueness of what the journal is offering is really about publishing papers that really speak to the, the different types of unique ways that we think about different populations, the focus on social and community health, and really thinking about what those norms are in different spaces and how that needs to be brought into how we think about policies and their acceptability in different spaces. Yeah, and that fits in with one of the comments that's appeared in the chat, which is about, you know, how, how often we try and cut and paste initiatives that are successful um, inappropriately. So it, it, is, it is about thinking these things through. And I, I think that also links into a, another question that's been asked, which is, I'll, I'll read it as it is. I might need to stick my glasses on, it's quite small text. Um, so in certain community contexts, especially in conflict affected areas, how would you assess the link or sometimes the disconnect between on the one hand programmes on engaging boys and men and on the other hand, programs focus on women's leadership and gender-based violence, which focus on women, girls, and other marginalized groups, or those who are at the receiving end of privileged masculinities. What have been the approaches so that these movements complement each other with a sense of equity? And I guess probably Cody, maybe you'd like to. Yeah, I can take this and then, and then pass to others. I mean, absolutely complementary. And I think anything we do in, in the sense of engaging men and boys, particularly in their own health, but also in the health of others, needs to be within a, a feminist framework um, that centers gender equity at its core. I think when we talk about men's health, there is a space to talk about men's health and its impact on men. But there's also a space that's necessary to talk about sort of the impact indirect and direct that men's health has on others. And I think this is all one conversation and it's a, in a way of framing. So as you're thinking about programs, you know, some of the work that Equimundo does in the Middle East is working with fathers and sons around sort of trauma and post-conflict settings, but then engaging the women and girls within that family unit towards the end of the program to sort of think around a family vision and, and that sort of stuff. So I think it absolutely is complementary, and it, it, we do not, you know, we can't be taking funds and resources away, I don't think, from those most vulnerable, but it, it is important that we do address men's mental health as a root cause of some of the cycles of violence that we see across the world. So um, if anyone has... Anything else they would like to add, feel free. Um, my only quick thought is that it, it speaks again to the relational definition. Like we tend to think of health and well-being in a particular way, but if you think about the ways that men often define health when you actually ask them and engage them and do qualitative work um, or other work, that you actually see a very different relational defin definition of health. And a lot of that speaks to exactly the what you're describing, Cody, in terms of there is this connection between the masculinities of what they're trying to do in relation to others, and that that's an opportunity, whether you frame it in terms of masculinities or the things as it relates to manhood, where you're thinking about the aspirations and the values that are underlying the choices that they're making and how to understand um, those particular contextual factors and the aspirations of what health really means to them at a very concrete level. So the, the male body schema, again, that Steve talked about in his work um, years ago that um, Watson, I believe, um, originally um, talked about really speaks to this issue about sort of, you know, it's, a, it's your health in relation to um, others and thinking about the, the gender-based violence as, as part of that picture. 
Yeah, and someone's just made the point in the chat that, you know, we need to be careful about sort of contextualising men's health as a, a zero-sum game where focusing on men automatically means reducing a focus on women's needs. And I think that links very much to the idea of understanding gender as a, as a relational issue, um, which I, I think is very much the point that you were making, Cody, that, you know, things that tend to improve the health of men would tend to be beneficial if the approach is a transformative one would tend to be beneficial for women and children um, and and you would hope vice versa um i had a question i was thinking about tc for you specifically which is whether or not in your experience around developing the resources that you have with within the foundation whether you think that men are more ready um, to have sort of mental health conversations now uh, and whether you think that that's um, helped maybe by the more um, virtual aspect of the sort of podcasts and, and other type of resources that you've been developing yes we we felt with confidence that that men were ready but if nothing else we we felt that the pandemic uh, allowed us to step into the space probably with uh, more readiness to have the conversations. I think for for many people, um, in speaking to subject matter experts, for those who hadn't previously struggled with their mental health, I think the pandemic has challenged that in many ways for a variety of different reasons, uh, safety, isolation, uh, stress around re uh, financial resources of their children, whatever it might be. And so, you know, if you think about the timing of when we stepped into the space, we, we did so late spring last year. So we were about a year into the pandemic. Um, uh, and we felt like the conversation was always important to have, but we, we believed that the pandemic likely allowed us to step into it, perhaps in a more receptive way. And I think that has been reflected in our engagement uh, so far. Um, I started... Uh, uh, building programs and awareness back in 2011 for the same reasons I mentioned earlier. I worked for the Vancouver Canucks at the time that Rick Rippin passed away from, from uh, depression and uh, did work with Kevin on a, on, a, uh, on a provincial program, which has now become a um, program across North America called Hockey Talks and uh, is about getting, uh, uh, again, same, same type of strategy, same commonalities of high, high, highly influential people to start these conversations. And I believed then that once the genie came out of the bottle, it wouldn't go back in. Um, it's been another 11 years, uh, but uh, I think every every time we chip away at it a little bit, um, the opportunity uh, just gets better and better to, again, back to my earlier phrase of normalizing it. And I think the pandemic, as challenging as it's been for everybody, has allowed us to normalize those conversations. And um, because there's, a, I think, a bit more of a common theme running through people who didn't even know what anxiety or depression may have felt like prior to the uh the pandemic yeah so something something uh, positive can come out of something quite negative that's excellent and um, Derek I was intrigued you you probably more than familiar with the, the long-standing debates in health promotion about the the structural versus the individual mm -hmm. um, and I know I know from your work that you know, you're a, a great advocate of understanding health disparities in relation to structural concerns. So it was quite, quite intriguing that you then present a sort of self-care model. I'm, I'm just wondering whether you could say a little bit more about that juxtaposition between mm -hmm. you know, the interventions at a structural level and the, the sort of individual self-care level. Yeah, again, I think for most of my work, I, I try to, it ends up being separated because of funding and other things kind of to, to another point that was sort of raised in the chat. But I think there's always a need to think about how do men operationalize these things for themselves amid the structural conditions, amid the ways that we need to make structural change. So again, you have to, like, we can't wait on structural change of, you know, the ways that we think about what masculinities are, the ways that we think about how to infuse those into families, networks, and communities to then wait on that to, for individuals to change because so many are already suffering, struggling, and perishing because of that. So 
when we think about what are ways to do that at an individual level, it actually, I think, does speak to both needs. But I always think that there's always, it's we've, we've separated the conversations artificially of the need to create structural change and sort of the micro individual level change when we actually constantly need to do both. And so I think this was hopefully sort of speaking to that. And that was kind of why I raised it and, and was suggesting that a next step needs to understand some of the structural constraints that these young men are individually facing, but then also think about how do you infuse that into the messaging of what needs to happen going forward and help them actually to come up with, again, more positive masculinities, more of the, the different the unique frameworks that Barry was talking about in the, in the question of um, the novel frameworks that would actually speak to these issues um, that are gonna be challenging because a lot of the, the more novel frameworks tend to be limited by what's considered fundable. Um, and so we tend to, you know, teach to the test or speak to the test if we are sort of grant driven that you have to think of frameworks that are actually going to be fundable in a certain space. But yeah, I think it's really for me the both and part of that. Yeah, I'm, I'm aware of the time. Are there any closing comments from any of the three panelists? Um, thinking again in particular in terms of what Global Action are trying to achieve here. Anything that's come out from what you might have seen in the chat um, that might help Global Action in terms of develop the policy agenda or develop the policy advocacy agenda around men's mental health and well-being. Any final comments? My only brief, final brief, comment. brief ones. <laughs> yeah, no, Steve, my, my will be brief. My only final comment is if uh, any, anything that I was able to present today resonated with somebody that was on here that they feel like um, I, I could learn from that would work more effectively in, in Canada or conversely that they might be able to model uh, in their respective area, I would definitely um, welcome that op opportunity, so. Thanks, TC. Cody, Derek. Nothing from my side, just a big thank you to the organizers and, and those who attended. Looking forward to continuing this conversation for sure in the quarters to come. So thanks so much. Thanks, Cody. Yeah, I guess my last quick thing was first, um, we, I don't know that we said explicitly, Happy Men's Health Month all. Um, and um, I, I think what this represents is the, the power of global action to bring together these types of organizations and you know bring together and, and highlight these kinds of models you know from Canada from Equinundo who's you know really global um, and how to how to bring those visibility so that people can be inspired to to translate those into spaces and take the nuggets of what works for them in those spaces and apply those to to men's health issues locally as well as globally. Well, thanks so much again to uh, Global Action for organising this and for the three speakers. Just a very quick um, reminder that the hopefully the abstracts from these presentations will be published in the International Journal for Men's Health. We're also always seeking papers if anyone's interested in submitting papers. Um, and a final, final reminder that the recording of this and I think the slides themselves will be available on the Global Action for Men's Health website. Um, is there anything else, Peter, that I've forgotten? No, that's it, Steve. You've only forgotten to thank yourself for chairing <laughs> so expertly. So <laughs> thank you very much indeed for everything. Yes. <laughs> Big pat on the back for you and, and all the speakers. Thank you very much indeed. Brilliant. Well, yeah, thank you to everyone who attended as well. If the panelists could just hang on for a minute. Um, we're going to have a quick chat if that's all right. Yeah, absolutely. Of course. Thanks.
Okay, guys, um, I'll just switch the recorder off.